So happy fifth birthday to our Beaver Valley location. If you're new to Northway, we have six locations around the city. Our Beaver Valley location celebrated five years. Just a couple weeks back, I was able to be there. Um, you know, it's just an incredible church with incredible people. I always feel so welcome um, when I am there. So uh, yeah, way, way to go, Beaver, Beaver Valley. Um, you know what, I was thinking about this though. When I, when I looked at that little video earlier in the week. And, and if you were around Northway, say six, seven years ago, and you were giving, thank you, because you made that happen, right? Like a, a church doesn't launch like that without resources. So, so thank you. Like last week, we showed a, a little video um, from some folks in Kenya that your giving is making a difference to, that they're planting churches there. So those of you that give so faithfully and consistently here at Northway, I just, I just want to say thank you. You're making a difference here in this region and, and then literally across the globe. So I've got a great text to jump into today. As we've been walking through this book of Philippians. Um, you know, do all things, it says, without grumbling. <laughs> you ready for that? Huh? So let me pray for us, and we're going to jump in, okay? So, so God, um, thank you for Beaver Valley. Thank you for our locations here around this region. Um, Lord, we uh, thank you for those that give so faithfully. And then, God, as we just open up this text and, and, and look at this challenging verses about us trying to get control of our mouths and what we say, uh, just be with us in your son's name. Amen. So we are in the fifth week of this series as we're walking through Philippians. Um, this is a very short four-chapter book of the Bible. It's found in the New Testament. It's actually a letter from the Apostle Paul to a church in a town called Philippi. And we've titled this series, Fear and Trembling. Like if that doesn't get you excited to dig in for nine weeks, right? Nine weeks, we're gonna talk about trembling and, and fear, right? But actually that comes from a verse in chapter two that we've like almost sort of centered this whole series around. So it's this verse here in, in Philippians 2.12. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. There it is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So in week one of this series, about four weeks back, Amanda Beggs was up here and she overviewed sort of where we were headed over the coming weeks. And she spent a lot of time, if you recall, in that phrase, work out your salvation. Well, why, why do I have to work out my salvation? Like I thought that my salvation was a free gift from God. Like that it's not something I have to earn. Like it's not something I have to, um, you know, keep all of God's rules and, and do more right than, than wrong and be a good person. Like, like I thought that that was the entire point of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was that my salvation was a, was a gift. And as long as I put my trust in him, I receive that gift and then I am saved and my eternity in heaven is secured, right? All of that is absolutely true. Our salvation is a gift. However, like if you were here in, in week one of this series, Amanda, she, she used this analogy, this, this illustration to really help us try to get a hold of what this means to work out our salvation. And she told a story about her and her husband giving their little daughter, Myla, a bicycle for her birthday, right? And she was so excited. And when they gave her the bike, they didn't say, now as long as you get good grades and you behave, the bike is yours. They didn't say that. They didn't say, you know, once, Myla, you learn how to ride it perfectly, then the bike will be yours. Nope. They gave her the bike. It was her bike. But just because she received the bike, she did not mean she knew how to ride it, right? She would have to go through the learning and the, the riding it, the falling off of it, right? 
the training wheels would come off and she would fall off again. And it would take a lot of brush burned knees and scraped elbows until she finally like found the joy of riding her bike. Our salvation, similar. The minute that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. You are in Christ. It's a gift, no strings attached. But you have to learn how to ride the bike. You have to work out your salvation. And it comes with a lot of falling and failing and sometimes some brush burned knees, right? But please hear me, as you work out your salvation, it also comes with a lot of peace and a lot of joy. And you find a lot of purpose in life. See, see you own the bike, your, your place in eternity, it is secured and assured, but your time on earth here is you're working out your salvation. The theological term for this is sanctification. Right? It, it's the, when we say yes, we are in Jesus. Sanctification, though, it's this working out to look more like Jesus. That's what this series is all about. When Amanda preached that sermon, you know, four weeks ago, I was her host here in Wexford. I was like the announcement boy for the day, you know, getting up and down, um, so therefore, I heard that sermon three times, three full times. I listened to that analogy about the bike. And each time I heard that illustration about the bike, it stirred up a little guilt in me, a little bit of regret. Nothing to do with the theological sanctification part of it. But rather what it did is it reminded me of the fact that I never really taught my daughters how to ride bikes. <laughs> we bought them bikes. They own bikes. See, our house had this gravel driveway and we were on this really steep hill right in the middle of it so they couldn't ride in the streets, so which means that anytime you had to teach them how to ride a bike, you had to pack up their bikes in the car or the van, you know, the helmets, elbow pads, everything, drive somewhere to, t- and, and, and where to take them around our house was pretty far and, and it just seemed exhausting to me. <laughs> so I don't think either of them to this day really knows how to ride a bike. It's a, it's a dad fail. Like I'm just, just we're friends, right? I can express it. Maybe the guilt I carry about that to this day is why I'm just not a big fan of bicycling. Just not. If there's any bicyclist in the room, I'm going to offend you here. I'm sorry. Just giving you a heads up. I see, I see people in the gym on a stationary bike, you know, pedaling. Sometimes they're sitting there with a cop, like coffee with no lid on it. I'm like, dude, you ain't working out. Like, get your rear end on a treadmill. Like, that's, that, that's not working out. And then I, I walk by like the spin class, you know? You, your gym ever had those spin classes? Bunch of people sitting on their bikes in front of a big movie screen. Oh, we're in a nice meadow. We're pedaling through the meadow. Oh, here comes the hill, everybody. Let's pick it up. Get up on your pedals. It just seems silly to me. I, I don't know. <laughs> and bicyclists, come on, man. You're always wearing them spandex uniforms. like. Even the spin class, like it's necessary to wear a spandex to a spin class. And I'm sorry, some of you folks shouldn't be wearing spandex. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying it. You outdoor bicyclists, you know, I see you riding around. <laughs> you got those helmets on with the aerodynamic thing, like the big point going off the back, like you're, like you're a superhero flash from the Justice League or something. Like... How much wind drag do you have on your head that you need that? Like, how much faster does that make you go as you're wheeling around North Park? All right, I know all the bicyclists are going to be emailing me. Next week, they'll be rallying out front. They'll be <laughs> protesting, challenging me to a spinoff. So, I'm so scared. Um, all right, where was I? T- today. Today is actually the very next section where it says, work out your, your salvation. The very next section. That was verse 12. I'm going to pick up in in verse 14. The rest of this series, we're going to be talking about how do we work out? How do we learn to ride this bike of salvation? The Apostle Paul, man, he opens up with the hardest, I think it could be the hardest piece of riding this bike. The hardest part of trying to work out your salvation. So I'm going to read this just straight on through. And then I want to come back and and sort of pull it apart a a bit. So here we go. Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Notice all things, it says. 
that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. This is Paul speaking here from prison. If, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. All right, let's break this down. It said all things. Do all things. What are these all things that Paul is referring to? Well, he lists them in the verses, some of them, in the verses right before this. It's what Amanda Beggs preached about last weekend when she was here. If you recall, it says, she, she taught from this, it said, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So what is the all things? Well, one of the all things is don't be selfish. Do all things. One of those all things, don't be selfish. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. So here's a second all thing. Care about other people. All people. Think of them more highly than you do yourself. It goes on. Have this mind yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. So empty yourself. What does that mean? Give yourself to people by taking the form of a servant. There's another all thing, serve people. Amanda talked about this last week when she was talking about bending low and seeing people around you. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, here's the last all thing in this section, humble, humble yourself. So, so this is a big challenge, right? To do all things, to go through life, do all things without grumbling or disputing. What does these words mean, grumbling and, and, and disputing? So I dug into the Greek here a couple weeks back and really looked at these words. Well, that word grumbling, here it is. I'm, I'm not going to try to pronounce that in Greek, um, but it says expressing resentment. So what does grumbling mean? It means when you're expressing resentment. Unwarranted dissatisfaction unjustified annoyance with people. It's what's coming out of your mouth. It's like, oh, that dog on that person, I can give him, I can't stand what he just did. I'm not taking this anymore, right? It's this grumbling. It's unjustified. And then disputing, this was interesting. Like, I didn't see this coming. This word, when you pull it apart in the Greek, there it is, it translates into thoughts. It means to consider some translations, it says to con considering evil thoughts. See, this, what's, this is what's going on in your mind, sometimes right before you're about to grumble. It's what's stirring and rolling over in, in, in your mind. It's internal. It's in your head, right? So why does Paul open with this challenging us uh, about grumbling? Why, why is it so important? Because I think... Our mouths and our thoughts could be our biggest stumbling block to working out our salvation and looking more like Jesus. Look at this verse in, in James. James 3, it says, For we all stumble in many ways. Amen, right? We all mess up. We're a mess. We stumble. We do stupid stuff. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's perfect man also able to bridle his whole body. This text is saying if you can manage somehow not to stumble with what you say, you can bring your whole body under control. According to this text, like it's harder to stop grumbling and disputing than maybe any other struggle or sin in your life. Because we are a people that have mastered the art of grumbling. Come on, like let's be serious, right? We have mastered the art of complaining and being critical. We are a people that is just quick to judge, always looking to blame, need to be right. And that word disputing there, it, it, it's saying that even when you're just thinking this stuff, it's, it's just as bad. Running something over and over in your mind is the same thing. And it's affecting your sanctification. 
And if you are a person that grumbles a lot, you might be crushing people all around you. And then you're not even aware of it. Can I ask you, have you ever met a highly critical, complaining, judgmental person that you're drawn to? That you're like, I want to hang out with that dude. Well, in fact, I hope he mentors me. I need some of that. There's this powerful prophecy about Jesus from the prophet Isaiah. It's this powerful um, prophecy of the Messiah to come. And he's telling us, this is what the Messiah is going to be like. Here's how you can recognize him when he comes. 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah said this, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet what? He did not open his mouth. He, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before its shears silent. So he did not open his mouth. Jesus, he, he leads this perfect life that led him to the cross. He's misunderstood, he's abused, he's beaten, he's spit upon. You know, and he did not open his mouth. Folks, how much further would, would we be maybe along in working out our salvation if we just kept our mouth shut a little more often than not? I've had people come up to me sometimes and like open up a conversation by saying, um, like, hey, I don't want to sound critical. Well, you're about to. Like, I mean, then, then don't say it. Or my favorite one is this. Not to be rude. Well, then think about what you're going to say. Because it's probably going to be rude, right? If you're giving me a warning. The text says, like, it takes it even a step further. further. Like, don't even internalize that. Like, stop yourself be, be, from rolling it over and over in your mind. According to the text, like when it comes to disputing, like you're not a hero because you thought crappy things about me for a couple weeks and just didn't say them. Like it's just as bad. So according to this text, it's a big deal, this grumbling and disputing. It's a big deal for us working out our salvation. We gotta get a hold of it. So let's keep going. In, in verse 15, it says this. Um, be, you, that we can be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish. So if we get this, if we don't grumble, we can be. That's what it says. So, so, I, I, so think about blameless and innocent. Like, what does that mean? Like, is my goal somehow to be perfect in this area? Because that's impossible. Like, I'm going to say stupid stuff from time to time. Like, I just am. I'm not even going to realize it, right? What does this mean? To, to, you know, because if that's the bar, perfect, I can't do it. So, so here, I, I found Psalm 19. I was looking and I stumbled across this and it, and it says this, Psalm, one, Psalm 19 says this, who can discern his errors? So it opens with that. Like he, what the psalmist is saying is here is like, man, our sins, my, my failures, they're so deep and some of them are even so hidden. Like how can I possibly ever be blameless? Well, there's two steps. The first one is this, he, the psalmist says, God, declare me innocent from my hidden faults. So, so acknowledging that there's sin and stuff in my life that I'm not even aware of, and sometimes it just comes out of my mouth, right? And the psalmist is asking, God, in those times when I don't even know, you know, deal with those for me, for, forgive me. And you know what? He did. Jesus on the cross, you're forgiven. But the second step is this. He says, God, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. See, these are different than the hidden ones, right? These are the ones where you're just being blatant and you're just being defiant. You know you shouldn't say this. You know it's not right to say that out loud or to think it, but you're going to do it anyhow. These are these presumptuous sins. Like I know I shouldn't be talking behind this person's back. I know I shouldn't be having this conversation, but I'm doing it anyhow. And you know what, doggone it, I'm right. So I'm gonna say it and I don't care because I'm right. See, the author of this Psalm is saying, you know, God, don't, don't let me get to that point. Help me, like stop me before that stuff even comes out of my mouth, right? And, and I love this psalm because it says, you know, declare me innocent from what's hidden 
and helps me stop these defiant, blatant sins. And then it closes with this. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgressions and sin. You can be blameless and innocent in this area. You, you can be. See, the beautiful thing about working out our salvation in this area, we don't have to do it alone. We have the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit with us all the time. And the Holy Spirit can help us in those presumptuous sins. If you just listen and get tuned in and slow it down. See, see it's about asking God's grace in these hidden faults and then asking the Holy Spirit to help you in these defiant, blatant times. Right? And here's what I think. As followers of Christ, like trying to work out our salvation to a world that's watching us, if we just got a handle on those presumptuous sins of grumbling and disputing, we'd impact the world. If we just got that under control, just the parts where we know this isn't right, I shouldn't be thinking this, I shouldn't be saying this, why am I being so mean? Why do I gotta be so, just get our handle on that and we would impact the world. Why is this so important? Well, well, in the next two verses, 15 and 16, the Apostle Paul gives us two really big whys that this is so important. And in verse 15, he says, because if we can get this under control, we can shine. We can shine as lights to the world. We, we shine to a world that desperately needs hope. We, we reveal to the world just a glimpse of Jesus. Let me just be brutally honest right here, right, okay? And I'm not looking at anybody. I'm going to look back at the wall. So I'm not talking about anybody in this room. But I, I know some Christians that are not shining. You're mean. You're judgmental. You're critical. It's causing you not to shine. You know, the second thing that Apostle Paul says is that if we get this under control, we won't live in vain. We won't labor in vain. When we get to the end of our lives, we won't say, boy, he was a good dude, but I don't want that but at the end of my remembrance. And most of that has to do with your mouth, right? You, you know, I've been working hard to try to work out my salvation. And this text is saying like, man, don't say something stupid that would cause all of your, you're, you're working out your salvation just to be in vain, right? You don't want that. So, so I have three grandkids. And um, my middle one is Wyatt, and he's now four years old, and he is an amazing little guy. Man, I like love him to death. Uh, even like as his personality is being formed, he just sometimes, he can be like a real serious kid, sort of sometimes like a thinker, hard to like even get to smile sometimes. He's just a, a bit of like a quiet, sometimes introspective kid. And I'm gonna say this, but his parents would agree complete with, completely with this statement. Sometimes he can just be a little grumpy, he can. He, he can. he can be a, a so Lissa, uh, his mom, my, my daughter, will say, Wyatt, she'll just look at him sometimes. Do you have the grumps? Because he just like, you can tell, he's got a face, like so, something's going to come out that, that's grumpy. Is something bothering you? You know, you look a little upset. Do you, do you have the grumps today? So, so here's a picture a few years back of, of, of me and Wyatt. Check that out. Really, it has nothing to do with the grumps. I just like that picture because look at my bicep. Like, come on. Huh? <laughs> You can't get that in a spin class. Nope. There might be some snow on the roof, but there's heat in the pipes, right? All right, take that down. I don't want anybody stumbling. I don't want your faith stumbling looking at that. So here's a picture of Wyatt with the grumps. There he is. Now he's grumpy. That's the grumps right there, right? And see what's going to happen. The next word out of his mouth is going to get him in trouble. So, so Alyssa, I asked her, what do you do, man, to, to help him? when he's got the grumps. Well, here's the one thing she says. Sometimes just give him a little time, right? Hey, I know you're upset, buddy. And before we talk about it, let, let's, just, let's just chill for a minute or two. Let me go get you a snack, right? And you can calm down and relax and then we'll talk. And here's what I think about that. For some of us, as we work out our salvation in this area, we gotta be slower to speak. Slow down. The next time you wanna give somebody a piece of your mind, give it a little time. Right? Go, go have a snack. Go eat a popsicle or something. And ask yourself, is this really necessary? And is the tone I'm about to bring it wise? Is it a grumbling tone? Can I have this conversation in a different way? 
take a little time. She says the second thing is that sometimes all he needs is a little change of scenery. She'll just say, like, let's go outside, buddy. Or let's go in your room. Come on, let's get this out. We'll, we'll play with this. So she'll say, hey, let's go outside. Let's get your bike out. You can ride it. I'll walk beside you because my dad never taught me to ride a bicycle, but <laughs> I can walk along beside you. Um, so a little change of scenery, right? Like here, let me just say, like if being on social media pushes you to grumbling and disputing, get off of it. Right? If a certain person at work continually just pulls you into a complaint festival, stop hanging out with him. 30 plus years ago, I taught school in the public school, Pittsburgh public school system for a year. And I used to have lunch in the teacher's lounge and it was a toxic place. Teachers sitting around in there complaining and insulting these kids that, that we were teaching. I just started eating my lunch at my desk. Just had to remove my, sometimes a change of scenery can cure the grumps. And three, she says this, she said, sometimes she just decides like, why, let's have a dance party. And she yells out, Alexa, play Shake It Off by Taylor Swift. And they just start dancing around the room, swinging each other until the grumps are gone. You know, this text today I read, it concludes with, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, here it is, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Sometimes you just got to dig down and find joy. Find a reason to be glad rather than to grumble. See, we forget that Paul is writing this letter from prison. He has every right to grumble, right? And to dispute, but he doesn't. He, he writes this letter to this church in Philippi and he's basically saying, rejoice with me, dance with me. You know, when I have really lousy thoughts going around in my mind or this deep desire to give somebody a piece of my mind, I've got to choose joy in those moments. I've got to find a spot to be glad. In this season for me, something I keep in the front of my mind is my grandkids, right? They bring me joy. So whenever I'm having these thoughts, I just turn my attention, I focus on them, I think about them and I find joy. Instead of rolling these thoughts or grumbling, right? I stop and I pray for them and it brings me joy, right? What, do you, what, do you, what makes you glad in your life? Focus on that. Come on, focus on that. You know, when, when it comes to grumbling and disputing and working out your salvation, folks, you have a choice. You, you can go through life as a fault finder or a hope finder. And I got news for us. The world is full of fault finders. We don't need any more of them. The world's in desperate need of hope finders. Will your world and words be marked by complaining, criticizing, gossip, negativity, discouragement, grumbling, and disputing? Or will your words lift people, encourage people, bring hope to people's lives? See, if you open up Jesus and you look at his soul, what you're gonna see is compassion and love. And if they open up his followers, that's what they should see. The same thing in us. Folks that are working out their salvation that are not marked by grumbling and disputing. People that are, that are known for what they're for, not for what they're against. P people that deliver hope. People outside the church should look into this church and not see judgment and condemnation and self-righteousness and grumbling and disputing. They should see Jesus. The church is supposed to give people a glimpse of Jesus. That's why we're working out our salvation. That's why it's so important. Paul wrote this letter to a church. Let's not forget that. He's writing this letter to a church. Today, right now, there's six churches that are tuned in right in this moment across this region that call Northway home. If just our six churches went about taking this very seriously, what an impact it could have. If we, as believers, really got a hold of our mouth, of our thoughts, what a difference it would make. People would talk about the church differently. They talk about Christians differently. They talk about Jesus differently. 
Let's pray. God, we thank you. Um, I, I just, Lord, right now in this moment, whatever was that you placed on someone's mind, whatever the thoughts, whatever the maybe past grumbling, God, one, would you free them up from it? Bring forgiveness there and healing. And then, God, let us just, let us just leave here differently. Just let us be a folks that, that, that just are out there encouraging, that, that, that we're, we're bringing joy to people. We love you, Lord. We lift this up in your son's name. Amen.